fold. Um, this is kind of experimental. The first service is going on. It usually goes on for about an, an hour or so. So uh, we'll, uh, I'm not going to speak at you for an hour. I promise you that. Uh, we'll just I'll, uh, cover some material, and then we can ask questions, and then uh, discuss some things. But if you need to get up, if you need to spread around, do whatever you need to do to stay comfortable. And remember, uh, there's probably going to be another service after this, so I don't want to compromise that. So if you need to get up and you need to walk around, that won't bother me in the slightest. Do whatever you need to do to stay, to stay comfortable. Uh, and I thought we might uh, begin by uh, singing, uh, singing uh, one of those hymns we've passed out. Which one did we pick, Elizabeth? Come Thou Fount, okay, Come Thou Fount. I think I know that one. Uh, great, so, all right, let's do that. Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the name of fixed upon it, name of God. Redeeming love. The next one? Is there another verse? I just don't know which one it is. <laughs> Rest me. Me. This place. And I know by thy name. Me. Safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Wonderful, thank you. Let's pray. Father, we are, uh, uh, we stand in wonder at the wonderful fount of blessing that you in your Trinitarian self are for your people. Uh, how you, Father, have loved us with an everlasting love. How you, Son, have purchased our redemption at the cost of your own blood. And how you, Spirit, have opened our eyes and convicted us of our need for a Savior and then made that Savior, Christ, beautiful in our sight uh, that we might rejoice in him in that great salvation. So, uh, Lord, we ask you by your Spirit to be present among us uh, and do that good work of uh, a counselor uh, convicting us of where we need to change and come into conformity with Christ and then working that very change in us by your good grace, Lord. So thank you for this time and this opportunity and this wonderful facility that we have. Uh, may it uh, be used of you to exalt Christ in so many ways uh, that as he is lifted up, you would draw many to yourself. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Uh,
All right, team. Yeah. Well, we are starting a series on uh, uh, women, uh, what kind of portraits from the family album of our family, the people of God. And in particular, we are going to uh, look at some women, uh, women that we should know and honor. And uh, I'm going to try to draw some women that maybe, maybe some of you might not even have heard of, and hopefully bringing out their stories a little bit. Uh, the idea uh, uh, came to me while I was meditating on uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, not long ago, where Paul, you'll remember there, he talks about how we as his people are a body, and different ones function different ways, an eye, a nose, an ear, what have you, and uh, uh, he says, now in any typical culture, there are going to be some in the body who, who in expressing their gifts and their talent and their, uh, their roles, uh, the culture's not going to quite look upon them uh, with uh, equal impressiveness or not valorize that particular thing. And uh, that's just kind of the way it is. In Corinth, for example... Uh, they thought that impressive were those that were able to use rhetoric and so forth, and the, and the others that had other gifts. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't all that impressive. Uh, and Paul says, oh, no. No, no, in the body of Christ, what we want to do is recognize the vital importance of every contribution. And if there's a cultural situation in which some aren't given as much honor or credit or appreciation, then what we want to do is we want to compensate with that as the people of God. Uh, so looking back, oftentimes it seems as though the women in our midst who God has greatly used get somewhat short shrift in the annals of history and appreciation. So uh, we want to try to rectify that somewhat if we can in this series. So that's kind of the motivation of this. Plus it's just fun. Everybody loves a good story. And I'm hoping that we've found some edifying ones. So uh, that's where we're headed. Um, and this first uh, profile, uh, we've called the woman whose scarves were all over the land. Uh, or we might call it Selena's scattered scarves. So here we go. The historical context of our drama has been called the Age of Reason, an era enamored with the powers of the human mind to make its liberating way in the world, liberating above all from the hobbling shackles of revelation and tradition. So they said, but in this age, reason had its hardy twin, ridicule, which would probably be the greater menace to the faith. The solvent of satire bit deeply at the very foundations of Christianity and subjected to mockery were not only its tenets, but also its devotees and especially its leaders. George Whitfield, there he is, George Whitfield was among them the great preacher of awakening in a spiritually slumbering age. Uh, dramatic, even theatrical in his bearing, he was an easy target, especially uh, his crossed eyes. There he is. If you look closely, you'll notice that he had crossed eyes. People loved to make fun of him for that. Indeed, Remorselessly, he was made the special subject of lampoon in a stage performance, doing uproarious rounds in the London theaters, wounding to Whitfield, and also bolstering the prejudice. It really did seem a hindrance to the gospel. But inexplicably, at its height, the play, in mockery of Whitfield, suddenly stopped. As it turned out, David Garrick, the far-famed and premier Shakespearean actor of his day, had exerted his singular influence in that thespian world to bring the production to a close. 
this not on his own initiative, but for a dear friend who had asked him to do so. Who could that have been? But more than mockery, uh, George Whitfield and his gospel preaching co laborers had to struggle against a prideful prejudice ensconced in the very church from which they sprang, the Church of England. Um, there we go. There's a, a, more, a better picture of Whitfield, I suppose. There he is preaching. I, if it were a video, you'd see how dramatic and thespian he was. Um, Vital Christianity was at low ebb, and the typical Church of England vicar was more preoccupied with fox hunting than preaching. And that was probably a good thing, however, as the preaching done was so terrible, it was described as mere Mohammedanism, or Islam, without Muhammad. Just awful, awful preaching. Morality and decorum was the weekly summons from the pulpit. And the notion, oh, thank you, that's a great idea. Yes, a uh, little stifling in here. It's all the hot air that I'm in. Uh, morality and decorum was the weekly summons from the pulpit. And the notion of being born again, proclaimed as a necessity by uh, George Whitfield and his compatriots, was thought extreme, indeed indecorous an overzealous enthusiasm. That's what this born-again stuff was called, damningly called. That's just enthusiasm. Indeed, a church bell was struck at, uh, at the time, minted with this inscription, hurrah for the Church of England and down with enthusiasm. Uh, well, at first, the efforts of the gospel awakeners to rouse the somnolent churchgoers was politely ignored by the reigning clergy. But as soon as the awakening seemed to be making inroads in their parishes, those in power exerted legal force to restrict and muzzle the enthusiasts. Venues were denied and meetings were broken up while the magistrates would look on uh, indifferently. But then, quite unexpectedly, the King of England himself interposed his royal will that such religious persecution desist in his realm. Ah, oh, that's a, yeah, that's helpful too, definitely. It seems that someone had reached the King's ear and prompted his protective decree. Well, as we shall discover, the very one who could move the levers of the London theater could also sway the royal court and did not hesitate to do so for the sake of the gospel. And here she is. Whoops, there it is. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Go ahead, whatever you can do to help us out. Selina was born August 24th, 1707. We're not quite sure where, as the family had several homes, but likely the imposing mansion at uh, Staunton Herald, there it is, uh, was, uh, th that was the seat of the Shirley family, an illustrious family. Here, that's, uh, let me show you what it is today. There, there it is. You can see it a little bit better. That's where she was born. Uh, Staunton Herald. They were an illustrious family in whose blood that of emperors, kings, and queens mingled profusely. She was the second of three girls, and it would seem sheltered luxury would be her lot. But when she was nine years old, uh, her eye was arrested by a funeral procession bearing a small coffin of a girl no older than she. Transfixed, she followed the cortege to the burial ground and from that day would often visit the grave. 
It marked the beginning of a seriousness about life in the light of impending death. And this would mark her all of her days, that little experience as a nine-year-old girl. Knowing that frivolity was a dominating feature of much of the English aristocracy, and that she would marry within that society, young Selina often uttered the prayer that she would marry into a serious family. And God granted this desire in husband Theophilus, the ninth Earl of Huntington, also, and in fact, even more so of a family of royal descent. Well, for all their seriousness, uh, they seem to have had quite a happy time together. Here is their family. There is Selina, there's Theophilus, and there are two. There would be more children, but those were the ones that were alive when the painter painted this image of them. But marriage uh, did not extinguish the serious streak which expressed itself in the young countess in a very in, 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 a, in, a, in a busyness in doing good, especially by way of benefactress to the poor. She was the frequent visitor to the cottages on her estate and never failed to meet any need with abundant charity. Her tenants came to refer to her as Lady Bountiful, and the sound of her approaching coach gathered a little posse of hopeful children for the handouts, whatever they would be. Uh, she became vastly admired for her reputation as a Christian lady, and that accompanied her in the high praise of her very high-born neighbors and peers. Well, this proved gratifying to the countess, but somehow not satisfying. Looking back, she would later discern that, quote, I was going about to establish my own righteousness. She had the praise and applause of her peers, but what about God? What would win his favor? Anxiously, Selina redoubled her efforts, hoping she might feel satisfied, that God was satisfied. But this resting peace tantalizingly eluded her. Her health broke in the strain, indeed completely to the point that she feared she was at death's door. Her illness had brought her benevolence to a halt, but with it, her sense of worthiness. Couldn't do any more good things, didn't feel worthy anymore. This compounded her terror. But in the gracious providence of God, her peaceless anguish perfectly prepared her to hear with wonder the ecstatic, breathless testimony of her sister-in-law, Margaret. Lady Margaret had recently heard one of these new enthusiasts. And you remember enthusiast was the name of these gospel preachers that were kind of thought to be the Wild West of religion, OK? Um, and uh, this enthusiast preacher had utterly demolished the hopes of heaven that Lady Margaret had lodged in her own goodness. But then, upon the ashes of these vain hopes had set forth a perfect and availing righteousness of Christ for all and any who put their trust in him alone. And Lady Margaret had ventured that trust. And the peace and joy that instantly flooded her heart was now radiant on her face. Taking Christ, his perfect righteousness and forgiving blood, Selina, too, felt that same peace and joy distill into her troubled heart. And 
testimony to how the spiritual deeply affects the physical, she immediately gained back her bodily health. Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> when having this spiritual peace, suddenly she's physically well too. Um, well, the Countess was now a Christian in a way never known or felt before. And she could not suppress telling all who would listen of the source of her newfound joy. But such a message struck her church-going hearers as utterly foreign or damningly bearing the taint of enthusiasm. A bishop was immediately summoned to persuade her back from these religious wilds to the safe enclosure and sedate way of decency and decorum in religion. But Selena had been poring over her Bible and ably asserted before the bishop her newfound faith as none other than gospel truth. It was such a marvelous encounter. You know, the bishop's kind of sputtering and she's saying, oh, but, but the Bible says, but the Bible tells us. <laughs> uh, well, gospel or not, most of her aristocratic friends found the message impertinent, impertinent, that was their word. As the Duchess of Buckingham told her, I quote, it is monstrous to be told you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl on the earth. This is highly offensive and insulting. And I cannot but wonder that your ladyship, she's speaking to the Countess of Huntington, okay, that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with our high rank and our good breeding. Uh, sad to tell, despite all of these appeals over all the years from Selena, the Duchess would die contentedly confident with her aristocratic heart. Uh, alas, how common is Goethe's presumption that God would never damn a truly cultured person. It's not how it works. It was a tough mission, very tough mission field for the Countess. For so often, the high and mighty are the high and haughty. Reflecting on God's grace in her own life, the Countess used to often say, thank God for the M. Thank God for the M. Referring to the apostle's phrase in 1 Corinthians 1.26, where he says, not many of noble birth. Thank God for the M. <laughs> thank God it's not, not any. But not many meant at least some. And this was her circle and mission field now. How might she reach them? If her high-born peers would not go to the gospel preachers, perhaps she could bring the gospel preachers to them. Thus began the countess's drawing room outreach. It's marvelous. Having received a lovely embossed invitation to come to tea, the upper crust would gather in her well-appointed drawing room, and you saw the likes of her mansion. <laughs> I'm sure it was well-appointed. To her well-appointed drawing room, and while they consumed fine cakes, soon found themselves spellbound by George Whitfield, who came at her invitation, sometimes as often as twice a week. And Whitfield was a consummate orator and could transport an audience by his word dramas. Um, here he, uh, oh, there's Lord Chesterfield. 
uh, as in the famous letters of Lord Chesterfield. Uh, yes, as um, once um, George Whitfield was, and they were so curious about him, they had heard things, so yeah, they were curious, so they, they, they liked to listen. And once George Whitfield was comparing the case of a benighted sinner to that of a blind beggar with his kind of blind staff going forward and tottering on the brink of a precipice, and then his, his cane slips from his hand, but he grasps after it right in the bah. And so Whitfield's describing that, and, uh, and uh, suddenly the suspense was pierced by a cry, leaping up and no doubt spilling his tea as he leapt up. Uh, Lord Chesterfield shrieked, good God, he's gone! Just having completely entered in, and then, oh, well, excuse me, sat down and then re-poured his tea. You know, get up, get up, get up. Stirred the tranquility of the, uh, of, of the moment. Uh, so this is how mesmerizing Whitfield was. By all accounts, his preaching, utterly mesmerizing. Indeed, David Garrick, uh, remember, he, he was, the, the, he's the, the premier uh, the, the leading Shakespearean actor of the day, uh, uh, to whom we've previously referred, uh, he was a regular at Selena's, um, at, at her drawing room outreaches. Uh, and uh, he, um, he marveled at how Whitfield intoned the word Mesopotamia <laughs> and confessed I would give a hundred guineas, that was a lot of money, a hundred guineas if I could just say the word, oh, like Mr. Whitfield. <laughs> and he's the top Shakespearean actor of the day. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, and for all of their gratified curiosity, they heard the gospel clearly and vividly declared. And if not many, heard the inner call, thank God for the ebb, thank God. And with the drawing room full of lords and ladies, the countess did not forget the downstairs and would send Whitfield to repeat his servant, servant, sermon <laughs> to the servants and the cooks downstairs so they would not be without the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, what would it take for the common folk to hear the good news? The worker in the field, the miner in the pits, or the thatcher on the roof who seemed eager to listen? Well, John Wesley, Whitfield's friend and fellow awakener, did not think it possible that someone could be saved outside of a church building. Remember, these were the days of kind of decorum in, in religion. Um, but wherever he, John Wesley, would go, the buildings, and he was one of Whitfield, he was one of these awakening preachers, uh, the buildings, the church buildings, were just too small to accommodate the eager hearers, and crowds would be turned away. Uh, here he, uh, there's, there's Wesley, John Wesley. I, my father had a huge print of this in his study, along with uh, a study of, Mar a, a print of Martin Luther studying the Bible. And so I grew up under the shadow of these things, you know, studying the Bible and preaching the good news. They're just, these images are so precious to me. <laughs> um, if I could have gotten back to take a picture off the one in our house, this would be a better, a better image for you. Uh, so on, on, on one occasion, when, when John Wesley had been preaching in the church, the, the, the folk who couldn't press in for the, for the, for the lack of room, uh, they lingered just outside the church, hoping to hear something through the open window. And as, and as John Wesley left, he, uh, he saw the sad crowd still present in the churchyard. Um, so, uh, wonderfully, he just stood upon a tombstone where he could project, and he just repeated his whole sermon, preaching to them too, to their great joy, and for many to their eternal 
benefit. Um, the fields were ripe for harvest, but the workers were few. Wesley, John Wesley, uh, also thought that none but officially authorized clergy were fit to preach, so was vehemently against lay preaching. That is, you weren't allowed to preach the gospel at all unless you were an ordained minister who had had all this appropriate education, you know, uh, uh, training and education. Um, and that was his belief. The problem was it was so hard to be able to get that education. Not many people could do it. It was a very, very narrow gate. Uh, and Wesley firmly believed this. But thanks be to God, two very persistent women finally persuaded John Wesley otherwise. Uh, his mother, Susanna, an extraordinary woman, one day I'm going to do a whole profile on her. Just extraordinary. Uh, Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles, and the Countess of Huntington, Selina. Uh, an uh, indomitable pair. And John Wesley finally agreed to go listen to a rather rough around the edges lay preacher that the Countess had been encouraging. Well, he most definitely lacked the Oxford accent of uh, John Wesley, uh, but evidently not the Holy Spirit. And Wesley came away concluding, quote, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good to him. And from there and then, lay preachers augmented the preaching force and became really the hallmark of this growing movement of awakening what we in America and the American church is called the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening. Uh, thanks to those two women. Uh, well, as the gospel sounded forth across Britain from village cross, as we saw with Wesley, to country vale, thousands experienced new birth. But what would become of them? There was a famine for the word of God in the churches. Uh, Wesley, John Wesley, a great organizer, developed classes, what he called classes. These were really small groups for mutual encouragement. So the, so the people that were converted in this open preaching, they gathered together in little small groups because there, there wasn't much fare for them in the churches at the time. Uh, so they were in classes. Uh, meeting for mutual encouragement. Uh, Whitfield's uh, converts, however, found no haven. Uh, they are, alas, said Whitfield, a rope of sand. He was not a good organizer. <laughs> uh, well, here, the countess stepped in. She had been gathering up preachers and deputizing them as her chaplains. And it was not uncommon for aristocrats to engage a private chaplain. You know, they'd, they'd have their huge estate and they wouldn't want to go to church, so they'd just, they'd just engage a chaplain and they would be their private family chaplain. And they would, they would do so. Um, and they would be identified by wearing uh, the scarf of what you know, the, 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 uh, the lordship or the countess, whatever, who would, who would sponsor them. So that's how they would be identified. And they would enjoy the authorization to preach because they had the scarf, the embossed scarf. Um, so uh, what Selena did was she began to build chapels for her chaplains. And they began to dot the landscape. And there, the new converts could go and be nurtured in the gospel. And she would fill their pulpits with her itinerant chaplains, moving them to and fro like a general commanding her troops. Hence, it was said in either delight by the friends of the gospel or in dismay by others, her scarves are all over the land. <laughs> or her scarves are all over the land. <laughs> uh, but more ministers were needed.
to save souls and to nurture converts. And Oxford and Cambridge, the, the, the universities, the two universities, Oxford and Cambridge, were the only places where Anglican ministers could be trained, and they were stolidly against any enthusiasm. Six students had just been expelled from Oxford, an Oxford college for such leanings. As their tutor complained, they were, quote, enthusiasts who talked of inspiration, regeneration, and drawing nigh to God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> For such, one was persona non grata and kicked out of the university. So you had no opportunity for training. Narrow was the gate. Uh, so, um, so the countess decided to found her own training college that very year, 1768, when the, when the students were kicked out. Okay? On her birthday, uh, Treveca was established. And George Whitfield uh, preached the inaugural sermon on the text, no one can lay any foundation other than Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11. Soon, it became a fountain of gospel witness flowing throughout the land and watering the very dry earth. The countess herself would interview all candidates and direct them on their evangelical, evangelistic errands, providing ponies for their transport and a good suit and a wig if uh, the setting demanded. So if, if she was going to bring them into her drawing room thing, she'd give them a really nice suit and nice wig, you know, so it would be less offensive. Uh, well, a good thing that she had money, you might say, uh, to finance all of these ventures, uh, yes. And here's the extraordinary thing. When it began to run low, she sold all of her jewels to the substantial sum of 698 pounds and 15 shillings. That was an enormous, an enormous amount. Why, it's as if she must have thought her treasure was in heaven or something, I don't know. I scarcely can forego pausing here and asking, I wonder what jewels we have that we might sell to put some more jewels in our Savior's crown. Well, the, the, the scale of these gospel ventures, it, it has to be emphasized in order to be grasped. <laughs> you can sit in the front row if you want. I won't hear the hissing as well unless you sit in the front row. <laughs> That's right. Um, the, the, the scale of these ventures has to be emphasized in order to be grasped. Lady Huntington's chapels were springing up everywhere, reaching great numbers. On Treveca anniversaries, also her birthday, you remember, um, so a twofold special occasion. She would summon her chaplains and they would preach in succession, sometimes nine of them in an unbroken row, to as many as 20,000 hearers. So we, we can't even conceive of, of people even being able to, crowds like that even being able to hear without amplification. But, but, but they, they could do this. I mean, the people like George Whitfield could actually project his voice when he came to uh, the colonies here and would preach in Philadelphia, say, people would gather on both sides of the Schuylkill River and they could hear him. It was unbelievable. So actually, if you were a preacher, Actually, developing a voice was one of the key and pivotal things to do. And if you look at, if you like, like read Charles Spurgeon's lectures to my students, he has a chapter on how to develop and take care of your voice, because this was your instrument. It was absolutely critical. 
So 20,000 people around. Uh, it was said that there were over 1,000 ponies seen in the surrounding fields of all these gathering. While the college was housed at Trevecca, 150 preachers were trained, ponied up and suited up. Uh, that, uh, that training uh, college would migrate twice, once to Chesant and then to Westminster College in Cambridge, where it was my happy experience to reside for one year in my own training. It was so much fun to, to be in that same spot. Uh, 200 new chapels were now opened. <laughs> Such pervading witness was bound to stir opposition. And it did. I mean, how many of her own chapels and chaplains can one woman have, even a countess? It's far too many scarves outside of her wardrobe, they said. Uh, you guys missed that. Uh, if you would, would engage a chaplain, the aristocracy, in order to give them authority, you would give them one of your scarves that was embossed. So that was their authority. And she would have hundreds <laughs> say that. Far too many scarves outside your wardrobe. Yeah. Vickers, who felt the enthusiastical encroachment, took legal action against her in the church courts. Not in my neighborhood, they thought. And the countess found herself in a legal pickle that threatened to halt, indeed pluck up, her gospel mission. It was then that she was able to appeal through her privileged access as an aristocrat to King George himself, who draped his cloak of protection around her. But it involved a watershed for the countess and her movement. She might gain royal protection through the Toleration Act, allowing dissenters legally, dissenters from the Anglican church, to gather and to preach. But to come under its sheltering canopy, she would have to declare her chapels dissenting houses of worship. So Selina became a reluctant separatist, forced out of the Church of England, and her chapel network, as, as John Wesley and his followers would later become, much to their own frustration and reluctance, they were driven out of the Church of England. They became their own denomination. So they were called, they came to be called Countess Huntington Connection Chapels. This is in 1781. So the, the Countess of Huntington's Chapels was its own denomination. Again, she, she didn't want to no longer be an Anglican, but they, they forced her out. It was the only way that she could have the freedom to establish these things. Yeah. This is her Countess of Huntington Chapel in Bath, or Bath, I should say. Um, it was uh, one of the great spas for the aristocrats at that time, so she built a chapel there so they'd be able to come and hear the gospel. Um, a conflict was not simply with the Church of England. Uh, doctrinal divisions began to emerge even within the ranks of the awakening preachers. A rift opened between Whitfield and Wesley, John Wesley, along Calvinist Arminian fault lines. Whitfield's followers became known as Calvinist Methodists, as differentiated from Wesleyan Methodists who followed John and Charles Wesley. Now the Countess had studied convictions in the matter, aligning her with Whitfield, but she maintained a breadth of friendship across those theological lines. And it's noteworthy that her judgment was highly esteemed, resulting in her frequently being sought for advice even at cross-grain to theological affinity. So for example, John Wesley, more Arminian, would consult her often and did uh, as to whether it be advisable to publish his journals. And happily, he followed her advice. And we have them in print now. They're marvelous. Given an opportunity to preach at Oxford, John Wesley sent the countess 
the sermon that he had prepared to see if she thought it suitable for the weighty occasion. She thought, upon reading it, it utterly unsuitable and told him so, directing him more promisingly. So he scrapped it and wrote another. The almost Christian was what he wrote which has turned out to be one of his most blessed sermons of all of them. An incredible afterlife in this sermon in terms of its impact for the kingdom of God. The almost Christian, thanks to Selena, Countess of Huntington. Uh, another of the great evangelists of the day. Um, I just can't wait for him. Don't you just want to meet this person? <laughs> it's just going to be so wonderful. Uh, uh, another of the great evangelists of the day, William Romaine, uh, sought her judgment on a work of controversy he was to send to the press. And she found a line in it that spoke uncharitably of another brother in the Lord. Uh, Isaac Watts, who we know from some of his hymns. And Selina, the countess, told him, take it out, take it out, which he did. <laughs> uh, oh, here's Isaac Watts. You remember him. Um, I, I wonder how frequent and consequential was the countess's hidden editorial hand for the church in her day. And these are a lot of church leaders that, that often are in conflict. And it's like, she's like a lubricant in, in, in the way they interact to the huge benefit and blessing for the harmony of the church in her day. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, how often has Anita saved me from what uh, I have witlessly written that would surely have caused calamitous offense or abiding hurt. You know, uh, how, many, how many teachers among us would come off far better in the stricter judgment that will be applied had we uh, subjected our thought to the judgment of our very wise spouses first. <laughs> so there's a free recommendation uh, that saved my skin. Uh, Neither were the countess's deeply trained theological instincts merely helpfully directive and cautionary. They were also instructive and clarifying. Like Priscilla, she was quite capable and ready to explain the way of the Lord more accurately to others. She certainly helped Henry Venn. Here's Henry Venn. Uh, I took that picture in the rain. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, she certainly helped Henry Venn to a fuller understanding of the gospel. Uh, once hearing him preach, she found him unclear on the atonement, so wrote him a letter. Oh, my friend, we can make no atonement to a violated law. We have no inward holiness of our own. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord our righteousness. Cling not to such beggarly elements, but look to him alone who hath wrought out a perfect righteousness for his people. And this exhortation proved fruitful in Venn's heart. As George Whitfield wrote to the countess, quote, your exertions in bringing him to a clearer understanding of the everlasting gospel have indeed been greatly blessed of the Lord. Um, so, uh, and he went on to be one of the great evangelical leaders of his day. And indeed his son and his grandson and, and so on for a long time, the Venn family. Well, there is, we must acknowledge, a rather prominent executive tone to the countess. After all, she was a countess. Perhaps this is the aristocrat in her manifesting. Uh, she certainly was confident that she knew what people needed to do and did not hesitate to tell them so. Um, uh, 
A few, it seemed, resisted her. Uh, John Berridge, there, there he is, another great gospel preacher of the age. Uh, wonderful guy. I remember when I was at, at Cambridge, I had heard that he was evangelist all the way to his death and even after his death on his tombstone. So I rode my bike uh, a long, 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 long way just to see it. And I found this tombstone. Look at this, friends. Isn't this wonderful? Here lay the earthly remains of John Berridge, late vicar of Everton and an itinerant servant of Jesus Christ, who loved his master and his work, and after running on his errands many years, was called up to wait on him above. Reader, art thou born again? No salvation without a new birth. I was born in sin, February 1716, remained ignorant of my fallen state until 1750, lived proudly on faith and works for salvation till 1754, admitted to Everton Vicarage 1755, indeed was a preacher of the gospel at this church while he was living proudly on <laughs> uh, works and faith fled to Jesus alone for refuge, 1756, fell asleep in Christ, January 22nd, 1793. Isn't that wonderful? An evangelist on his tomb. Reader, art thou born again? No salvation without a new birth. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's, that's John, that's John Berridge. Um, and uh, he, uh, he was, uh, uh, he occasionally uh, would deny her her wishes as she moved players around the Great Awakening chessboard. Uh, but he took no offense and admired her even in her sharp dealings. Uh, as he once wrote to her, Verily, you are a good piper, but I know not how to dance. I love your scorpion letters dearly, though they do take the flesh off my bones. And I believe your glasses, Countess, are better than mine. But alas, I cannot see through your glasses. <laughs> uh, she did have good glasses. She saw the big picture clearly. But she was not infallible and made mistakes as she herself acknowledged and regretted. Late in life, she said, as Christians, we wish to retract what a more deliberate consideration might have prevented. <laughs> There's a good lesson here for those who are often right and think themselves always so. Well, there's so much more to tell of the countess and her impact her practical knowledge of just what needed to be done was not restricted to the national scale, but reached down also to the quotidian matters of life. There's a, 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 um, Sally, uh, Charles Wesley's wife. Uh, and on one occasion, Sally, 